Hi everyone, it's Holly O'Neill, President of Retail Banking for Bank of America. Welcome back to Game Changers, the show where I talk to leaders who are changing the game when it comes to customer experience, business innovation, and financial health. This time of year encourages us to reflect on and show gratitude for the people and experiences that have made a difference in our lives. Today, I am so grateful to be joined by a woman who continues to have an incredible impact on me, our teammates, and our business, Anne Finucane. Anne is a living legend here at Bank of America. She's the former vice chair of the bank and former chair of Bank of America Europe. And she's held a number of other positions during her decades-long career with our company. Anne is widely recognized for pioneering sustainable finance in our industry, rallying firms to do more to fight climate change. And under her leadership, Bank of America established its corporate responsibility strategy, focusing on issues like climate finance and social justice. As one of Wall Street's most powerful women, Anne is also celebrated for her work to successfully reposition the company following the 2008 financial crisis. Today, Anne is a member of Bank of America's Global Advisory Council. She's also the chair of Rubicon Carbon, a next generation carbon solutions advisor and a senior advisor to TPG's Rise Climate Fund. Beyond her impressive resume, she's a mom, a mentor and a painter. Anne, I'm thrilled you're here with us today. Thank you, Holly. How did you know the painter part? I didn't. Somebody might have whispered in my ear. I, that was a fact I did not know about. Very interesting. Mm, I, Is that something you do regularly? No, and not well enough to have ever done anything other than to, you know, hide it at home. So painter and banker yeah. and all of these other amazing jobs. It's it's really impressive. So, Anne, you've worked in local government, advertising, marketing analytics, ESG, I think it's safe to say you've done a lot of traffic circles. You've gone across, up, down, over, and every direction. So can you talk us through your journey and how you made it to where you are today? Yeah, but it's sort of a windy road rather than a deliberate road. Uh, I started in local government because that's the job I could get in the Mayor's Office of Cultural Affairs in Boston. And uh, I began uh, bicentennial and then um, doing these programs called summer things so you put uh, festivals and performances out in the neighborhoods uh, from there I went to um, WBZ TV and I was uh, I was their creative uh, services director but now how that happened was nothing like anybody would plan <laughs> I got there the guy I was working for got fired and um, they needed someone to fill in quickly because headquarters was coming down. So I became the head of creative services. Perfect. And exactly. <laughs> and uh, so I played the part for a while until I could do the part. And then um, it was Westinghouse Broadcasting. We were the largest um, NBC O and O, so owned and operated um, affiliates. And um, they needed a woman in in management. So then the next thing that happened is that I was the woman in management. I was the only woman and the only woman in management. So um, again, this is what it's like to work in the 70s where the ladies room is somewhere in the basement right. and uh, it was a little different. So from there I went to advertising. I started on the creative side, then I went over to the uh, business side and that's really when my career changed. Up until then I'd pretty much been a more creative person, a writer or did um, set designs and things like that. But what happened is I was the executive producer for the agency. We did a lot of work overseas, a lot of work overseas. And so I would travel with the client and you have a lot of downtime. Uh, doing commercials is like watching paint dry. I mean, truly, you get the shot and then it's another half hour and another shot and so on. So you get to know the client, you're having dinner with the client and I began to realize I really like this business. Right. The business is more interesting. I uh, elected to go to the account side and then again through I think some hard work but a lot of luck I then became the head of account service there and so on and so forth until I had a fourth very unexpected child um, and went into consulting and from there I went to Fleet and Fleet became Bank of America. 
you're an avid learner, reader, right. you observe people to a degree that I find really incredible. Or creepy. Uh, no, it's <laughs> incredible, Anne. <laughs> um, but it, it really is inspiring. And, and so one of my vivid memories is watching you interview the domestic goddess herself, Martha Stewart, while we were in Dublin for a Global Advisory Council. So tell me about any other moments where you said, wow, I did not think I'd be doing that here working at the bank, or you could talk about Martha. Well, Martha's a trip unto herself. First of all, she's <laughs> a very good client of Bank of America. Um, Jane Heller, uh, one of our premier private bankers has been working with Martha for years. So we, as you know, we were doing a, um, a program for women, mostly women entrepreneurs in, in, in Ireland. And she was my charge to, to interview. And she's just very interesting because she's so matter of fact. She's very confident, but she's confident because she's worked so hard. So, Anne, you retired officially from Bank of America in 2021, but you continue to be a powerhouse, and you're the chair of TPG's um, Rubicon Carbon. So can you tell me more about Rubicon Carbon and its mission? Yes. The other thing is I did retire in uh, December of 2021, but then I stayed <laughs> on because I'm like the you know, guest that never goes home. <laughs> Um, and we welcome that, by yeah, the way. Yeah, right. Uh, as chairman of uh, B of A Europe, I stayed on as the chair, but not as you know a, a non-executive chair. Meanwhile, I uh, we had done a lot of work. The bank had done a lot of work with the Rise Funds, which is essentially a social impact fund, and um, they were starting a climate fund. And in starting a climate fund, we, the bank, and other banks were interested in how can you um, improve the both reputation and the efficacy of these carbon offsets because they were running into some controversy. So we've set up a company, Tom Montag is the mm -hmm. CEO, Gina McCarthy, the former head of the EPA and um, special counsel to uh, President Biden and probably the real architect of the IRA um, Inflation Reduction Act is on our board. Right. So it's a pretty impressive team that um, has tried to set this up. It's, you know, early days. We'll see how right. it goes. But I'm, you know, I'm optimistic. Yeah, well, it's I mean, it's incredible to watch, you know, a little bit from the outside here at the bank. But I love seeing you continue to, to continue to drive that. Um, so, Anne, um, we have something in common with the Special Olympics. You've spent a lot of time working with them, and I'm very passionate about their mission. So can you just talk about how you became first involved with the organization and then how um, your role has evolved with the Special Olympics? Well, I have a long relationship with Special Olympics. I had um, a cousin and an uncle that both had Down syndrome. As a young uh, teenager, sort of before you can work, so before I was 16, I worked at a camp for um, uh, children with uh, intellectual disabilities. And so I had a grounding. Mm -hmm. And then um, in adulthood, I continued to, I know the family well, the Shriver family well, and I continued to be sort of a, in a tangential relationship with it. I mean, those athletes are inspirational super inspirational and special it's something i've done with um, my kids the last few summers and it, it is a day that is not forgotten how did you get involved um i got involved through the bank and we did you know some work with support services and then i got introduced um to the local chapter here in Boston, and they annually went to the Special Olympics and volunteered. So I kind of married the two, and I have done that the last few summers with them, and it's you know a super special, fun day. Yeah, um, it is great. So, Anne, you have a gift of keeping things really simple, and you give great advice. And I don't think you remember this, but my first presentation to the board, I was sitting in a conference room with you, and you gave me some advice before we got on the board call. You said, keep it simple, stay calm, and speak the truth. 
um, in, in maybe a few more words than that, but that was essentially the message. And so um, that's something actually that I remember a lot. And I, you really have the gift of keeping the complex simple and being impactful at the same time. So our teammates out there are doing that every day, all day, when they're talking to senior leaders with initiatives that can get really complex. So I'd love to hear your perspective on that. I think it's probably something you've been pretty deliberate about um, in terms of delivering a really simple and clear message. Uh, well, thanks for that. I also usually recommend some chocolate <laughs> with the um, with the presentation for a boost. That's right. But um, yeah, so as you know, I read a lot. And my own experience is that in reading a lot, you see common themes, or where can you find the common themes? And that is the derivative of making the, the, um, the complex simple. But I also myself need the complex to be simple. I find lots of people, when they explain something to you, they lay it out like a series of ingredients that mm -hmm. they never put together. Right. And um, it's not useful. And it's, it's confusing, and life is already confusing. So if you have the opportunity, you should, be doing, you should be simplifying something. And if you can simplify it, it also demonstrates that you know something. That's right. So um, that's kind of how I see it. It takes a lot of work, and I wasn't good at it at first, but I do work at it. And I do think, you know, I'm, I've been a... I'm a lifelong learner. I read all the time. I ask a lot of questions. I have never found the answers to those questions necessarily on someone above me. I mean, it's a colleague or uh, someone junior to me or someone outside the business. And it's aggregating all of that that helps you rethink something and be a bit more creative in its answer. Right. Well, I think something you said is really true. It takes a lot of work. Right to be simple, right? And and we've done some complex things before where I actually rethink that is, okay, what does the audience need to know and what what it does not matter? And, and so it takes a lot of work to think through that before you start spitting out the ingredients. Well, you just said it. What is it they need to know? Right. When they ask you a question, if you just give it a pause, you know they're really asking you maybe something else or the essence of what they're asking. Or right. if you don't know, you can say, what is it that you really want to know? Right, right, exactly. So you've had a great career, still going. Mm -hmm. What career advice would you give to the people listening today? Well, I've had, a, uh, as I said, a windy road. And a lot of things didn't come out the way I thought they were going to. I mean, as a young woman, um, I was married early, I got divorced, but uh, you know, I was a situation where I would put my husband through graduate school, then he would put me through, but we were divorced by my turn. <laughs> so uh, yeah, how that worked out. <laughs> so it threw me off. I mean, that's the, the plan right, was already right. had gone awry a little bit. On the other hand, um, I was promoted early and quickly at a television station because there are not enough women or any women. And um, I took the opportunity and I used to go to see the sales manager because I didn't know how to write, read an income or a, a balance sheet at that because I hadn't gone to school now. <laughs> so, and I hadn't taken a math course since high school. So uh, I would bring him his lunch every day and he would teach me how to do right. um, the, uh, the accounting, if you will. And it was hugely uh, helpful to me. I don't know that the lunches were particularly good for him, but that's, it's the idea of if you're really a learner, you also have humility and you go to see people right. that um, may know something you don't know and then you let them know that you're grateful for them teaching you right. that. And uh, it doesn't matter what level you are or they, they are. They're going to teach you something. Right. Well, you are a lifelong learner. So... Just pivoting off that, what was a mistake that you made that you learned from in your career? Oh, uh, a million of them, mistakes. Well, I'm very direct, and I learned that uh, sometimes I'm too direct. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I am a good listener, but I'm also um, a, a little hard of hearing, so I stare too long. I know that. I'm a good listener because I have to listen. Right. It, it, so that's, a, that's an early issue in my life that I learned to overcome. Right by being a good listener. Right. Because I'm trying to figure out sometimes what someone's saying. Right. So I'm, well, I'm watching it all. Yes, well, being a good listener is incredibly important. So that was probably a skill that really worked for you. Right. Especially as you went down roads that were completely unfamiliar during your career. But I think at the bank, when I made mistakes, it's because I didn't take in enough information from other people. Right. I may have thought I had an answer and moved too quickly. and. Um, that's a predilection I have to move too quickly on something. And I would then have to retrace my steps and do right. it again. So taking in a lot of information, but also hearing from other people and recognizing that my view is not the prevailing view, perhaps. Right. Hmm. So, Anne, I know you come from a big family. Mm -hmm. You and your husband, Mike Barnacle, who's a journalist, and he's also on MSNBC's Morning Joe. You have kids and grandchildren. So how do you manage to stay so engaged in both? And I think part of this is, you know, the um, notion of balance, which I often say there really is no balance day to day. But what are your thoughts on that topic? How have you done it? How have you stayed so engaged? Because you really do that on both fronts. Well, all of this is full contact sport both the personal and the professional. I have a lot of stamina, so if I have a gift, it's the stamina. Right. And I'm interested. I'm interested in everything. So that's a gift. But um, I think you can do it all, but I don't think you can have it all. Right. Uh, I, I just think you're constantly striving to do the best you can, and you hope it's good enough. And I've thought that about work. I've thought that about my family. I've thought that about my marriage. But I mean, you, the, the nice thing about taking a breath in the morning is you have a chance to do it again. Yeah, no, that's right. And I think that's that's fair. You can't have it all all the time. You've got to do your best in any given day, given, you know, what's presented to you and, and make your judgment and value calls as you go. That's exactly right. But it's hard. Right. It is hard. You know, it doesn't make it any easier. It's just right how it is. Right. I, you know, and it's so much better today. Uh, I mean, the bank is very progressive in terms of um, allowing people to be who they are, right. uh, maternity, paternity, um, leave, and all of that. When I, you know, first came up in business, this did not exist. Right. Uh, in fact, um, at my where when I had children, I was at Hill Holiday, an advertising firm, and they established a. Uh, maternity leave because they hadn't had one. They just had not had enough women to have one. It right. wasn't that they, women took off on the the occasional woman that had a baby, right. but um, a few of us were sort of the same age and that's how that began. And they actually established a, a daycare center for a few years, wow. or actually a few years, probably 10 years. Right. That's incredible. So one of my recent favorite books, have you read Lessons in Chemistry? Yes. So it reminds me a little bit yeah. of that and what this young female chemist went through in just a completely different environment from what we're, we live in today. Yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, beg to relive any of that. Right, right. Well, thank you for paving the way for us. I'll leave it at that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, Anne, our financial center here at 100 Fed is named after you. Mm -hmm. Tell me about what that means to you. Well, first, I didn't know you were doing it, um, and Dean Athanasia invited me to come downstairs to see it, see something, and they unveiled it then. I cried, and I don't cry. Um, no, you do not. So, but I <laughs> was stunned. Um, I was just stunned. It was great. Right. What um, is the best advice you've ever given your kids? You're that good. Okay, I love so, that. So I, I believe in uh, imbuing as much confidence as you can in your kids because the rest of the world is there to let them know right. they're not that good. So, and which is not to make them um, uh, oblivious to fault, but rather that they have 
they've, they've got what it takes. Right, that's great. And what is the best advice your kids have ever given you? <laughs> Give it up, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on, they have to. Okay, we'll take it, we'll take it. Um, what are you most thankful for this holiday season? My family. I mean, I'm very grateful for my family. I worry about the world, don't yeah. we all right now? Yeah. Um, so I'm grateful for my family. I, I, I have to say I was, um, I'm very grateful for my career at the bank. I never expected to be at a bank, let alone have any success at one. So, uh, but the experience has been great and it's all about the people. Right. I mean, at the end of the day, you're around a lot of smart people. They teach you something. You're hoping you're contributing something. And um, I do fe feel like I was part of something that made a difference. That's a great feeling. It is, it is. And I can, I can say firsthand and it's, I often say it's about the people too, but the impact that you have had in setting the course for this company remains and I think will continue to remain um, for the future. So um, you've done a great job. Thank you. So thank you. And um, given we're talking about 2024, it's around the corner, what is the one thing that excites you about 2024? Actually, the whole, uh, all the work on climate does. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not really an environmentalist. I, I'm a believer in climate change and clean energy and that you can uh, combine capitalism with, with science to make a difference. So that's how I see it and um, I believe in capitalism. I actually think it is what makes uh, the U.S. different than other right. uh, democracies. And um, so I'm excited about that because I think we're uh, on the precipice of really making major changes that can help underwrite um, capital for, the, for emerging markets and developing economies. And I hope we're able to do all that. Yeah, well, let's hope it's going to be a busy year. Yeah. Um, so, Anne, thank you so much. It was a great conversation and so nice to have you in the building again. Thanks for spending the time and sharing so many pearls of wisdom, your continued positive energy for our teammates. We can only hope that we can leave a legacy as iconic and as impactful as yours. Thank you, Holly.